A very warm welcome to all of you. My name is Ashish and you're watching the series of Bipin Chandra's India's Struggle for Independence. Welcome to the sixth chapter of our series. We are now on the most uh, debated and the most asked questions uh, chapter of modern history and that is social religious reform movements. But I would hate to say that it is also one of the most misunderstood chapters of modern India. Most of the time, while we are talking in classrooms, uh, we tend to take it as a factual subject. We learn the names of the reformers, we learn the name of the institutions that they represent, and we try to mug it up. My dear students, here at Study IQ, this is what I was going to tell you, that is not the approach that we want to take it. Now, in this particular chapter, I'll show you, one, how to relate to the topic, and at the same point of time, to be able to make sure uh, that by the end of this lecture, you will have the names of the reformers on your hands, on the tip of your hands, and you will have no problem or no stress remembering them or recalling them. That is the way a chapter should be done. And this is how I will demonstrate at the end of the chapter, around 30, 35 minutes into the chapter, you'll be able to memorize all of them. Now, memorization is not also the end of our uh, goal. The goal is to make sure that all of you are able to relate to the topic, able to take advantage of the fact that such questions are asked in exams, score marks, and see your name in the final list, right? So, that is the end that we are aiming for. Now, let us begin with socio religious reform movements and particularly the National Awakening chapter. Now, this chapter is not written by Bipin Chandra per se. If I would tell you, if you have read the book, particularly particularly the introduction, nobody reads the introduction as such, but if you read the introduction, authors have told which chapters they have written for themselves and which chapters other authors have written for themselves. Now, there are several other authors in the list and author K. N. Panikar has written this chapter. Okay, So, we'll move about knowing what he thinks that peculiar set of our country, that is peculiar set of India, uh, why we needed social reforms as such. And he says in a very interesting way that, look, uh, India was having two domains, not one, two domains. There are two parts of India, as he said. And he says that one part is political domain. Okay. And what do you mean by political domain? Uh, which is represented by, for example, wars that were coming up in 17th, 18th century. So, we are talking about India where Britishers were coming up. So, we had talked about Battle of Plassey, we had talked about Battle of Buxar in 1764, Battle of Plassey in 1757, uh, or loss of Mughal prestige. For example, in 1857, finally, Bahadur Shah Zafar was exiled and Mughal rule was put to an end officially unofficially, it was put to an end much before that. If I would talk like Plassey or even the Battle of Patpadganj at around 1803. Now, all of these acts represented that uh, Indians had lost their touch in the political domain. This is what author K. N. Panikar says in this chapter, that India's political domain, where wars were coming up, in 17th, 18th century or where uh, there was a loss of Mughal prestige, there was a lot of uh, even uh, other Indian kings prestige, for example, Baroda, Marathas, uh, Punjab, and Maharaja Ranjit Singh, there was a loss of all Indian kings. Together, there was political subjugation and finally, it was represented by colonial looting, that is what you call as drain of wealth. Now, author says, that Indians lost this plot, the political domain plot of India. So, what was left? The social domain, the religious socio domain, the domains which had questions uh, like religion, which had questions on uh, women, and which had questions on caste. <coughs> it's a very interesting argument that we have to understand that the author says here that Indians indeed lost themselves to the Britishers on the demand of the political questions. But when it came to 
uh, imagining our religion, when it came to answering the questions of women in India, and when it came to reforming castes in India, all of these questions were considered within the religious social domain, and this is where Indians didn't want to lose to the British. They wanted to reform all of these things, but by their own agency. That means by their own hands and not by the hands of Britishers. This domain, they still wanted to fight for their, if I would say, sovereignty. They thought that, you know, at least this domain should not go away from their hands. At least they should decide how they will worship. At least they should decide how uh, the question of women should be resolved. At least they should decide or decide how caste equations were to be formulated in a new modern India. Now, keeping that argument in mind, we are going to see the areas of reforms. And particularly, there are three areas of reforms. The first area of reform, author says, is religion. Religion was reformed. Religion was revivalized. There were questions on religion. Uh, what to practice, how to practice. Second, was the question of caste. That is, was there casteism in India? And if there is casteism in India, how do we get rid about it? Third, was the question of women. That if there is sati system, if there is the question of vidori marriage, if there is a question of women's education or age of consent, whatever it may be, these were the three main areas in which we have seen socio-religious reform movements. Now, dear students, as I said to you, uh, it's very easy to remember stuff once you categorize into silos, once you categorize into compartments. And now we will see some socio-religious reform movements in the terms of religion or in the terms of caste or in the terms of women, all in different sections. There were some institutions which were working in all of the three, right? So, we'll see them. Now, particularly with respect to religion, let us first address the question of religion. Look at this particular very interesting paraphrase of uh, Raja Ram Mohan Roy. And it says, I regret to say that the present system of religion adhered to by Hindus is not well calculated to promote their political interest. And then he says, the distinction of caste introducing innumerable divisions and subdivisions among them has entirely deprived them of patriotic feelings. He is lamenting about the fact that Indian religion and the inherent caste system in the Indian religion has made it impossible for Indians to imagine a country as such and be patriotic towards it. Not just that. It also says, uh, in a very interesting way, that in order to imagine a nation or to feel patriotic, you need to shun your caste, not your religion. Raja Ram Mohan Roy in this statement was layering many arguments. We have to see those arguments. Now, that is where I said you, you don't need to remember facts if you remember it in the right way. This is what we also teach you in prelims to interview batch. When we teach you in prelims to interview batch, it's like we are planning and we are preparing you not just for prelims, but then for mains, particularly when you come to us after clearing prelims, in what we call as the mains residential program, we will sit with you for four months, during which <clears throat> you will prepare for mains at the same expenses of lodging, boarding, staying, everything else, so that answer writings and some other nitty gritties which are left during the preparation of prelims can be done in the right way. The idea is to promote you not just in the prelim stage, but also to see you through in the mains and the interview stage. The idea is for you to see your name in the final list. I know most of you are diligent students who are putting out your time and energy into such videos. And I would promise you, when you come to my classes, you will get much more than this. We'll have analytical debates as well as a way to memorize <clears throat> without laying stress upon your other faculty or without laying stress upon your other needs. For example, you have to study polity, you have to study economy, right? Use your memorization tricks there. But in history, it's all logical if you understand it in the right way. Since I'm the history faculty, I'll be vouching out for my classes 
in prelims to IIM. So, don't wait for any more days. Enroll using the code AshLife. If you don't use the code AshLife, you'll not get the maximum discount that you deserve so rightly. <clears throat> After using the code AshLife, you will be given this price, not before that. And this price includes all the lodging, boarding, staying, coming to us during the MRP programs at the same point of time, mains residential program at the same point of time, it will cover your mentorship costs, your books and <clears throat> the current affair schedules that we have daily while you prepare with us. So don't wait for any more days. This is the best package that you can get sitting at the comfort of your home at the same point of time when you are right there at the gates of the prelims, we'll call you here in our Delhi campus. Make sure that you crack that exam of mains. So, with this, keep keeping this thing in mind, remember that it's closing on 11th of August. The last, the batch is starting on 11th of August. Don't wait for more time. Use the code AshLife, enroll and see the difference. Now, coming back to the problems in religion. As I told you, what problems were there with respect to Indian religions here? Number one, religious superstition. There was a lot of superstition and obscurantism. That means narrowness. My religion versus your religion. Or uh, the fact that religion has magic, it has charms, it has spells, it can wade away your problems just like this. If you pay the priest, fine. That is well and good. Uh, because that is how you progress in life. Nobody knew what real religion tenets or real religions scriptures said to you. People had stopped reading Sanskrit or even Tamil and that made them realize that whatever a priest says has to be taken on the face value. Then you had the ideas of idolatry and polytheism. Now that was considered as a way different than what Vedas had also prescribed. For example, Vedas don't prescribe for idolatry or what you call in Hindi as murti worship or the worship of idols. Or <clears throat> worshipping many gods, not one god, but many gods or different gods for different purposes. It was also considered as revivalistic thoughts. That means you revive the religion rather than reforming it. If there are superstitions coming into the religion through some customs, you rather revive those customs, but you will not reform it. For example, Sati was not written in Indian scriptures, but it was carried on forward as a custom from 3rd, 4th century AD, ancient India. It was never prescribed in the Vedas, but yet people practiced it in the name of religion. Not only that, organizations started now coming up, you know, asking for change. The very first organization which everybody says is the Brahmo Samaj. Now, the idea of Brahmo Samaj, again, as I told you, no need to memorize it. You have to understand it. The idea of Brahmo Samaj was based on the pillars of Vedas and Upanishads. That means it used to go towards the real scripture writing of Vedas, what Vedas actually prescribe. You can do that only by learning Sanskrit and by also translating Sanskrit into other vernacular languages. For that matter, you can translate it into Hindi or Tamil or even English, so that common people can understand it. Now, that is what Brahmo started doing. It, it emphasized on human dignity first, opposition to idolatry, that means as Vedas told us, not to worship idols, Brahmos refused to worship idols. The criticism of social evils like Sati, because Sati was never mentioned, it was never mentioned in Vedas. So, the things which are not mentioned in Vedas, should not be practiced in the name of religion as such. Lastly, there were some people who were associated with it. Now, we have to know the names. The very first person whom you saw being associated with it was Raja Ram Mohan Roy. And other than Raja Ram Mohan Roy, there were people like Devendra Nath Tagore and Keshav Chandra Sen. Now, Keshav Chandra Sen later on had a split with the Brahmo Samaj and made his own organization, so on and so forth. Or Debendrana Tagore was a person who was known for Tattva Bodhini Samaj. That means the real, um, if I would say Tattva Bodhini means the one who wants to uh, look out for the real meaning, the pulp, the real essence of things. So the real essence of religion. Uh, 
later on raja ram mohan roy uh, in a way tried to take all of these men together and present to society an egalitarian real interpretation of vedas and upanishads that is what brahmo means to you now one thing which brahmo did very passionately was to give petitions to the britishers to ban sati as i told you this was one very important reform that was waiting its time in the sphere of women's rights as well as religion now most of you should think why sati was banned it was banned by william bentick in an 1829 legislative act but how was it banned was it banned on the grounds of rationality or logic that you know sati's system is nothing but a woman enters the funeral pyre of her husband of her dead husband how can a live person who is breathing enter into a funeral pyre that was the most inhuman act that you could have imagined voluntarily now was it banned because of being away from rationality or what arguments were used if you analyze this question you will understand that how brahmo samaj or how even raja ram mohan roy worked it was not banned on the question of rationality or logic nobody was arguing on those lines everybody was arguing in fact raja ram mohan roy in his uh, newspaper called as uh, miratul akhbar this was a persian newspaper and he used to say that look if we are true to our religion let's suppose if you are true to vedas can you give me a proof that sati system exists in vedas he used to say to the orthodox hindu groups like for example uh, raja radhakan deb of the dharma sabha happened to be the opposition member or happened to be the uh, if i would say uh, you know uh, antithesis of raja ram mohan roy so raja radhakan deb uh, always used to you know argue on the fact that indian custom should not be touched upon by the britishers but then raja ram mohan roy made it a argument which was very sound and logical saying that look sati is not not written in vedas so if something is not sanctioned by our law books or our religious texts then why do you follow it basically he said that sati was not a law of religion it was just a custom that people made out to be and there is no need to follow such custom you have to also understand sati in the context of bengali society now sati was practiced in the bengali bhadralok society more often what is bengali bhadralok society the bengali high class brahmin landholder society now in those days uh, a landholder used to marry more than once and most of the time they used to marry many age younger women than their own for example if a 60 year old zamindar used to marry let's say an 18 or a 20 year old girl uh, of course the zamindar would outlive the girl <coughs> uh, in a way the zamindar would die earlier than the girl and the girl would be left with zamindar's properties she would be she would be one of the young widows left by zamindar now that young widow had a chance to remarry or to partake that property and go and marry somewhere else that created the most basic economic problems or challenges that zamindar's land faced or house faced because one it was a question of pride of the house represented by the women and second was that the woman would also take away some part of the property of zamindar after he was no more in order to stop that sati was also being practiced and all of these arguments were put forward by raja ram mohan roy in his detailed researches in fact his own family saw and he from his own eyes he saw his uh, sister in law committing sati which he never appreciated now that tells you 
that the arguments and the planes of arguments were something else. I hope you don't have to now remember the fact, but you have to remember the logic behind it. In the same realm, you had another mission coming up, another reform in the way religion was imagined, and that was Ramakrishna mission. It believed in the spirit of Vedanta philosophy, that is Upanishadic philosophy, and essentially that there was equality among all religions. Ramakrishna Paramhans, who was the guru of Swami Vivekananda, used to preach that every religion is nothing but different ways of reaching the oceans, how river takes different routes to reach the ocean. Every religion is some or the other way to reach one and only God. Now, keeping this in mind, they laid stress upon removal of religious superstition. They were not in the favor of keeping charms and spells and ideas of miracles within a religion. They tried to remove caste rigidities, that there should not be caste rigidities in a particular religion. Untouchability should not be practiced. <clears throat> and it advocated the doctrine of service. Particularly, this was a doctrine which was given by Swami Vivekananda, the favorite disciple of Ramakrishna Paramahans and the most famous known face of the Ramakrishna mission. And he said that the service of all human beings is actually the service of God. You don't reach God by reading scriptures profusely. You don't reach God by just reciting Gita and Vedas and Mahabharata. You also reach God by helping a leprosy patient, by helping a hungry child be fed by milk. These are services to the mankind and that must be followed first. Now, actually, these were the major concerns that Swami Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda himself faced. For them, the sufferings of common human beings and their own brothers and sisters was more appalling to them rather than doing anything. Swami Vivekananda and Ramakrishna Paramhans later on, particularly it was the teachings of uh, Swami Vivekananda that led to the coming up of Ramakrishna mission. And uh, he kept Vedantic philosophy as his guiding principle uh, of the mission as such. Now, <clears throat> within the Muslim fold also, there were some reforms. So, be it uh, Swami Ramakrishna missions or uh, Ramakrishna missions, uh, ideas or before that Brahmo Samaj ideas, these were reforming ideas in the eyes of or in the domain of Hindu religion. Now, what about Muslims? Now, Muslims or particularly the question of Islam, it suffered a kind of complex after the going away of Mughal aristocracy. Most of the time, uh, the Muslims out that at that point of time in India faced and felt that their political hegemony was lost with the going away of Mughals because they were the prima, the most important uh, hegemonic empire before the coming up of Britishers and they ruled for a very long period of time from 1526. So when Mughals lost their plot completely, uh, most of the Muslims who identified with the empire also thought that their sovereignty is also lost. Now, there were some ex-aristocrats like Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan here himself who believed that Britishers didn't count Muslims as their collaborators. Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan used to believe that Hindus have embraced English, Hindus have embraced Western education and Hindus have proved to be collaborators of Britishers as merchants, or uh, as fellow administrators, judges, uh, be it anything else. And Muslims have been seen as a sore in the eyes of British. So he wanted to change that. And he continuously advocated for the fact that, that the members of the Islamic community should ascribe to now Western education, Western thought. So, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan advocated for English education. He advocated for coming up of Western scientific thinking in the minds of Muslims and supporting and becoming collaborators of Britishers in whatever they do. Now, he 
because of his thoughts, he became a member of the Imperial Legislative Council and was also given a knighthood. But what was more important for uh, his contribution to the to the larger Muslim society and to the larger Indian uh, society uh, was uh, coming up of Mohammedan Anglo Oriental College, which you now know as Aligarh Muslim University (AMU). It was founded in 1875, and it became a center for learning, particularly Western thoughts, ideas, and learning for Muslims. Later. Again, as I told you, this developed into the Aligarh Muslim University and an English school was also opened by him in Ghazipur. Arya Samaj, one of the most important revivalistic mission among the Hindu society, not reformist. Although Arya Samaj was also in some essence trying to reform the religion by saying about the castelessness, but it argued for Chatur Varna system. Now, what is the difference between Varna and caste? I'll explain to you in a very short way. Now, but let us see the other important ideas of Arya Samaj. It worked for revivalism, as I told you. The clarion call of Swami Dayanand Saraswati, who was the founder of this Samaj, was called as go back to Vedas. That means you should go to the original source, read it, and practice the religion as it is written in the Vedas. Now, when he says that, he was opposed to idolatry. He was opposed to casteism. That is, he was opposed to castes as such and idol worship as such and polytheism as such. He was also opposed to the worship, the kind of worship that Hindus do. Many gods. He was like, God is one, as it is written in Vedas, para Brahm, so on and so forth. And also the practice of doing idol worship is not ascribed to the Vedas as it is not written in the Vedas, so we will not follow that. But at the same point of time, he encouraged Chatur Varna system. Now, Chatur Varna system is the four Varnas, that is Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, and Shudras. Varna literally means color. Varna literally translates as color. But Varna in the Vedic age was not, particularly in the early Vedic age, was not decided by birth, but it was rather decided by occupation. So, Swami Dayanand Saraswati's views was that as one decides to do their job, their Varna becomes the same. So, if you are doing a job of, let's say, an agriculturist, you may become a Vaishya. If you are doing a job of a teacher or of a student, you are into learning and reading, you may become a Brahmin. And that will keep on changing throughout your life with what work you do. So, he was in the favor of Varna. Now, this is not as equal to what you call as caste. Caste is between Varnas. So, you have jatis which came later in, in, in later Vedic society. For example, I'll give you an example. Rajputs became one of the jatis or the sub-varnas of Kshatriya. Now, Kshatriya is a varna but Rajput becomes a jati in the early medieval Indian history. Now, he said that there is no place for caste as such in India but yes, I would ascribe to the Chatur Varna system. Now, that is the, the, the very subtle difference that you will find here. Uh, we'll teach you more when you will join our ancient Indian history classes. Okay? Now, the other major part of his idea was Sangathan and Shuddhi. That is, he was of the view that Hindus who have converted to other religion can come back and join the Hindu fold. Now, that was not allowed as per the scriptures, even as per the Vedas. Because once you have become so-called gone into the converted or gone into some other realm, you cannot be purified back and be brought to the religion's fold. But Swami Dayanand Saraswati was of the view that that can be done. Shuddhi should be done, reconversion should be done. And he was a vocal uh, person about that. So, Shuddhi and Sangatan becomes a very important facet of the Arya Samaj. Now, that is also more important to you, uh, keeping the fact that this year, as we speak in 2023, we celebrate the 200th birth anniversary of Swami Dayanand Saraswati. So, that becomes something for you to, uh, you know, lay stress upon this, this year's uh, questions. It may pop up in uh, prelims or main. And lastly, the coming up of DAV schools, Dayanand Anglo Vedic schools, colleges, institutions, they were all English, Anglo Vedic, English with Vedic education, right? So, they were also, in a, as I said you, there were some streaks of reformism within his emphasis of religious 
changes. Now, coming after the question of religion is the question of caste, right? As I told you, there were three spheres, religion, caste, and then women. In the sphere of caste and caste-related reforms that we needed, uh, this statement is very important for us to know. This statement says, no religion, no caste, and no God for humankind or for humanity. And it was given by Sahodran Ayyappan, who was one of the disciples of Sri Narayan Guru. Sri Narayan Guru happened to be one of the great social reformers, the great social caste reformers from the state of Kerala. And he said, Narayan Guru said, one religion, one God, one caste. To which his disciple later on said that, actually there is nothing. Because everyone was in a way agitated with the question that caste issues were not getting resolved. So I have started this caste uh, slides with his uh, statements. Now let us come to the caste reforms question and see what were the issues. Now, caste was an oppression that plagued Indian society for the last 2000 years. This is what Dr. Ambedkar said. See, no, no debate on caste can be completed without quoting Dr. Bhimrao Ambedkar, right? So, he used to say this thing that I would fight rather the oppression of 2000 years before fighting the Britishers because they are oppressing us for the last 200 years. So, I would rather fight an oppression of last 2000 years before fighting an oppressor of last 200 years. So, let me fight caste first. That is what Ambedkar used to say. And this is from where we have started it. But there were other problems that due to caste, lower castes uh, people faced in India due to the questions of caste. So, the very first was accesses. Public utility was not equally given to all the people, to all the Varnas and to all the castes in India. Education was not a universal good. Not everyone was having access to education. The up three Varnas, that is the Brahmin, Kshatriya and Vaishya, mostly time Brahmins and, and Kshatriya were given the Dwij status. I hope you must be knowing about the Dwij status. Dwij status means twice born. That was reserved only for the highest of the Varnas in Indian society. Dalits or the Shudras were not considered as twice born and hence their access to education and public utility was largely not allowed. At the same point of time, there were restrictions to their temple premises or to the places of worship. Even egalitarian religions, religions which were not supposed to keep castes, became a casted religion. For example, Sikhism was an egalitarian religion but I hope most of you know that within six also now there are caste. So was true and so is true with Islam. Islam is also, does not advocate castes or the creation of jatis, but even today you will have many castes among Muslims. One such caste which is in news nowadays is the Nama Shudras. Uh, okay, Namshudras, which is from Dalits, not from uh, Islamic community. Uh, but from Islamic community, you have Pasmanda Muslims or Muslims, which represent the lowest or the most backward of the Muslim groups. Okay. Uh, anyways, the first person that uh, we are doing here is Sri Narayan Guru. Now, Sri Narayan Guru uh, tried to uplift class castes from Kerala's Izawa community or the toddy planters of the Izawas in Kerala. Uh, now, he used to say this simple thing that, you know, multiple gods and multiple religion and multiple castes are not good. So, you should have one religion, you should have one caste, you have one humanity. That is how it should be. And uh, later on, it started as this ideas and thoughts started as Aruvipura movement, uh, which later on became SNDP movement or Sri Narayan Guru Dharma Paripalana movement, right? Uh, as, I, as we have seen in the earliest of the slides, 
it did not materialize that much it did not gain that much traction and hence his disciples said that no religion no god and no humanity for the mankind right so something like that anyways there was one discussion between mahatma gandhi and sri narayan guru and this tells you that what they thought about the caste equations now mahatma gandhi was all about abolishing untouchability understand this is one of the most important agendas of caste related problems in india is abolition of and was abolition of untouchability you, we know that under article 17 it was very first uh, fundamental rights and very first importance that indian constitutional makers gave that abolition uh, sorry uh, that there would be uh, abolition of untouchability but but gandhi ji also advocated for the same but there was slight difference to what he advocated and what he withheld for example look at this conversation which is very interesting out here in support of the chatur varna gandhi ji was for the fact that abolition of untouchability should be there and in fact if anybody should be given the credit of abolishing untouchability should be gandhi because for the very first time in 1919 itself 1919 he brought the issue of untouchability to the main political front even before uh, ambedkar could launch his mahat satyagraha in 1927 so uh, gandhi used to say that look i support chatur varna that is i support the four fold division of societies into varna that is brahman kshatriya shudra and vaishya because all of them do different jobs but that does not mean that dalit should be abolished or they should not be touched or they should not be integrated within the society, within the society because the vedas don't say so the vedas say about chatur varna but the vedas don't say about untouchability so i will abolish untouchability but i will keep chatur varna this is what gandhi used to say now while in support of chatur varna he had an argument with uh, shri narayan guru and this is a very interesting argument as i said he said that look it's like the leaves of the trees they are not the same not all the leaves of the trees are same so how can all the members of the society be same you know in status and in work hence all the members of society can't be equal they should be treated according to the work that they do now look what narayan guru said to this uh, argument of gandhi and he said that to which uh, if i would say to which narayan guru replied that in reality the juices of the tree flow equally to all the leaves he saying that look all the leaves of the you know trees have equal xylem and phloem now we know about the divisions and the rootings that we have thanks to the microbiology part he say that trees provide equal nourishment to all the leaves it's upon them how to grow right so you should not in a way distinguish between the members of the society while giving them access to material things right and uh, allow them to right to grow and allow them nutrition equally let them grow as they want now this was a beautiful conversation which happened between two great uh if i would say social reformers gandhi also should be put in the list of the social reformers because he was the one as i told you who brought the question of untouchability for the first time in the national political agenda itself even before narayan guru or ambedkar or periyar as we'll see now uh brought it to the forefront now you had the self respect movement the next caste based uh, reform movement that was coming up and that was led by ev ramaswami naikar also called as periyar now he was very widely respected in south india particularly in the dravid area of south india tamil nadu etc uh it was known as self respect movement because the goal was in a way to give prides to the original inhabitants of india that is the dravidians and their dravidian past and this was in di in direct opposition to the brahmins because they thought that they represent a clash between aryans and dravidians which was not so of course but they wanted to make sure that dravidians should own up their past which was more glorious which was more original and they were the original uh, residers of the indian heartland 
and hence they should have that self respect now particularly he denied even the superiority of brahmins and the superiority of some brahmanical uh, scriptures for example manu smriti was uh, being criticized by not just uh, ambedkar but also by periyar right so such law books which which uh, discarded or which had uh, divisions within society on the basis of caste was also discarded by periyar satya shodhak samaj by mahatma jyotira phule now satya shodhak literally means searchers of truth with respect to casteism and mahatma jyotira phule and savitri bai phule his wife they belong to the mali castes and were a major social reformer in the area of maharashtra satara to be particular not just that they also set up a girls school in pune and they used the symbol of raja bali as opposing the symbol of ram for example you know raja bali and the story of vaman avatar where lord vishnu uh, becomes a young brahmin boy and seeks arms and seeks uh, you know uh, uh, dakshina from raja bali after he performed a yagya uh so in the dakshina he just asked for three steps of land that he would cover from his uh, legs and raja bali gave it very willingly later on uh, uh vaman avatar being the vishnu that he is he became very big in size covered the whole earth with one feet the whole sky with the another and asked for the third feet to be kept now raja bali said that okay you can keep the third feet on my head and thereby putting raja bali on to the grounds or on to the patal log as the story goes now according to jyotiba phule when he wrote the book slavery or gulamgiri he said that this is a story of inversion that means raja bali representing the lower caste or dalits becoming the rajas or becoming the hegemonic uh, emperors and then also the cunningness of brahmins uh, represented by lord vishnu here uh, would put them at the patal lok at any given excuse so this was also some form of reimagination of indian scriptures and stories that was done by such scholars okay uh he wrote the book other than gulamgiri other than slavery he wrote the book sarvajanik satya dharma temple entry then became the most important uh, uh social reform because this the 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 temples particularly in travancore were now being open to the dalits and to the lower castes in india at that point of time uh who were there in the movement in the thick of the movement people like t madhavan k k lappan shri narayan guru and mahatma gandhi also so it was in 1924 to 1931 that these movements were going on uh the idea was that untouchable should you know have uh, the access to the temples ambedkar later on in 1927 launched the mahat satyagraha which was opening up of tanks uh or the drinking water to the dalits now as we study the entry of dalits into or the entry of lower castes into the temples of india uh you have the question of entry of women right so i hope most of you have not forgotten uh the question of sabri mala right where women uh were questioned to enter the uh, shrine as such or the question of women entering uh the shani shignapur in maharashtra right so now the history is just like that you know the stories remain the same of the question of access and the question of going towards god or having an access to god of different so parts of the society and now the question is for women right so i hope you can relate to it coming to women based reforms with this basic question and uh, again as I told you it's a very interesting part uh, because women based reforms women had many questions to be dealt for themselves for example the question of sati as we have already seen but the question of widow remarriage do women have a right to remarry or at least widows have a right to remarry education should they have a right to sit in gurukul in patshalas or age of consent one of the most debated topics in colonial india that at what age is the appropriate age for a women to get married i am sure most of you will be shocked to know that the age of consent was being debated for just increasing the age from 10 years to 12 years yes 
that was the irony the age of consent that is the marriageable age for girls was 10 years and the government wanted to increase it to 12 years and that is what what was debated it's appalled it's appalled it's 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 is beyond the logics and rationality right even the vedas did not prescribe for such young girls to be married a social reformer a very known social reformer gopal ganesh agarkar said that look this generation of indians are children of children that means you know child marriages were taking place everywhere and people who were born of such child marriages actually were never given a, a very safe bringing up because people who were bringing them up were themselves child were themselves children that was the stark reality that women faced in india so you had many reform educations or many many reform organizations for example prarthana samaj in maharashtra under atmaram pandurang worked for women's remarriage and education women's remarriage was also worked by ishwar chandra vidyasagar you all know that his efforts led to the passage of women of widow remarriages act during the time of lord dalhousie and one person who himself married a widow was dondo keshav karve maharshi dondo keshav karve from maharashtra showed it leading by example by marrying a widow then in the sphere of education we have already seen savitri bai phule opening schools for girls particularly lower caste girls in pune and for women's right gopal ganesh agar now age of consent debate itself was uh, fought in the court by advocate bahram ji malabari who also was a parsi social reformer but the most interesting case was the case of rakma bai that was also asked in prelims uh, of i think 2017 or 18 uh, which shaped the age of consent act 1891 the government just wanted to increase it from 10 to 12 years and yet there was a debate as such it should require a debate or not so that was the condition of women that was the question of women uh, that india faced now i would rather say that everybody was in favor of increasing the age but understand that nobody wanted britishers to do it because that was considered as an interference into the family life of indians the rakma bai case the very famous rakma bai case it so happened that a zamindar married a 10 year old girl she became pregnant and later on because of pregnancy related complications she died now zamindar was not tried off you know not arrested legally because he was within at before the passing of age of consent act he was within his laws to marry a 10 year old girl but the moral question of marrying a 10 year old girl was put up in the court and many indian reformers argued for and against it even those who argued against raising the age of the girls were for the fact that look if we have to consider the increasing the age of the girls this question should be left to the indians and not to the britishers we will reform our society on our own but that did not cut ice with the britishers and as you know any social reforms has to be backed by law and this is here one such social reform which was backed by law led to increase in the marriages of age by the way even today now we are debating about increasing the marriageable age of girls from 18 to 21 right i hope you know about this i will leave you with the images with the brilliant images of women achievers of india from that point of time and i would tell you to identify them it's very easy for me to say the names and you will maybe forget it so i don't want i want you to search it out who are these illuminaries who are these women who led by examples who became professionals who became doctors practicing doctors at that point of time in india when even enrolling a girl in a patshala or in a school was considered as blasphemy so this is the end of the chapter at the end of the chapter i'll also tell you to join our courses from p to i that is prelims to interview stages because this is just you know a round up this is just a book that you are reading in the class 
you will connect everything. You will read ancient, medieval, modern. You will have answer writing. You will have mentors, daily practice of the questions, prelims, interview, and mains. That is what sharpens your skills to become the most successful candidate from just being an aspirant. I don't want you to just be an aspirant for one, two, three years and so on and so forth. Don't lose this opportunity out. Study IQ is known for making things affordable with quality. We will not and we don't compromise with our quality. I hope you can understand this with our lecture series here. Look out for the coming up lectures on India's press struggle and India's economic liberty as we wanted that in the next few chapters. Also, if you have any doubts and if you want to download the PPTs of uh, these lectures and the lectures which were given to you before, please connect with me on the Telegram, join the community. You can ask me any doubt related to history or any doubt related to UPSC. We have many other students there who are members of our classrooms and you can directly converse with me. I'll be more than happy to reach out to you. Thank you for watching. My name is Ashish.